Good evening all, this is John Milburn for Laws 11062. This is Contract B. We're into week five of Term 2 2020, and this week we'll primarily deal with week four material. But just to follow on from last week's discussion regarding estoppel, firstly, can I thank everyone for the way in which you embraced the live session last week? That was excellent. Secondly, in relation to estoppel, it is an area that I do want you to undertake some additional research on because you're going to come across this topic, this concept on a regular basis. And while you'll deal with various types of estoppel, probably the one that I want you to concentrate on most is simply equitable estoppel. It's a very broad, if you like, almost all in almost it's not fully almost all encompassing form of estoppels so equitable estoppel derived from equity of course is designed to respond to potential injustices that may be suffered where a person departs from a promise so therefore given that many of these issues relate to contracts it's pretty clear to see how there might be significant implications for contract law when we deal with issues around uh, equitable estoppel. Now there is common law estoppel um, which only relates to representations of past or existing facts. It's not dealing with representations of intentions or promises. But equitable estoppel goes much further. There was the English um, derivation through High Tree House um, line of authority. But you'll need to understand what the elements of equitable estoppel are. But it's just, I guess in brief, you could say that there's a requirement that there's an assumption or expectation that is encouraged or even induced by a party. And the person to whom that representation was made relies on it to their detriment. And here's the key point, such that the reliance by that, if you like, innocent party is such that it would be unconscionable for the representor to depart from the original statement. And you'll see that term a lot unconscionable in this and other units throughout the study. You'll need to know what the remedy is. Um, the remedy is essentially discretionary, which makes it more difficult for me to provide um, any further commentary. But when enforcing an estoppel, Australian courts look at the impact that the enforcement will have on others. So it's not just a matter of looking at what the plaintiff requires, but if there are third parties affected by this, then the courts will have a very clear, uh, close look at whether the discretionary remedies should be um, enforced. Now, Walton Store and Ma, of course, is the key case. And one of the basic principles for that is that it unified proprietary and promissory estoppel, which are really forms of equitable estoppel and they did so as a cause of action. So unlike the High Trees case line of authorities in England, in Australia, issues around promissory estoppel can be wielded as a sword, as a cause of action, and not just a shield, not just as a response to an action that's been brought against you. So there's some of the key issues that you need to consider, understand and document in terms of estoppel have a look at my level three preparation for exams in relation to estoppel and other areas so that you have a clear statement in your mind as to what these things mean before you're even asked the question. I hope that makes sense. All right, so this week we're dealing with week four material. I'm pacing this um, to, to cover the key areas. This week's material is particularly important. We're dealing with equitable concepts again, and we're dealing with unconscionable conduct, duress, and undue influence. So they're the key areas, and it's important that you have a good way of distinguishing between these, um, have some authority, and have some clear priority in your mind as to which one is the primary argument that you would use in certain circumstances, I'll give you a hint, duress, for example, is not the one that we generally lead with. So oftentimes you see books and commentaries written with, you know, duress comes first, 
and then undue influence and then unconscionable conduct. I think that the third of those is the most important. So I'm going to flip this. And I've mentioned that's the, the approach that I like to adopt in many instances. But before we do that, just some broad discussions. Now, are there any questions, comments, anything that you want to chat about? All good? All right. If there are any questions or comments, please ask through the chat facility or simply unmute your microphone. We'd love to hear from you. Beyond what we're dealing with in this unit, you might want to think about broadening your legal experience. And one good way of doing that is to consider attending at a community legal centre. So Community Legal Centres Queensland has a website um, in Harvey Bay. I co-established uh, the Community Legal Centre here many years ago. There are now 33, I believe, around the state. And it's a great way of becoming involved in the profession. Whilst I no longer provide um, advice to participants, people that come along to the legal centre, it was always my practice for many years that when doing so, I would have students join with me. And of course, we'd need the consent of the, um, of the person who sought the advice to have students there. But it was a great way for me to engage with students. And um, often, they were very valuable in terms of the contribution. So keep that in mind. CommunityLegalQueensland.org.au is the website address. Now, the other thing I want to just touch on is this. From introduction to law, you would have been familiar, you're familiar, of course, with the ways of considering legal logic and legal writing. Now, the one that um, AJ, um, in particular, AJ George, who is the person who is primarily the, the presenter of this unit, um, deals with issues is the, the IRAC method, I-R-A-C. It's one of many, it's, it's very popular. Um, one of my favorites is a slight variation. It's the C-M-I-R-A-C, which is where you deal with the conclusion first and then the material facts and then IRAC. So it's just to add a few things at the start. When you're writing your paper in relation to a problem, whilst you can strictly use the IRAC method, I tend not to, and one of the reasons I don't do that in practice is that in legal problem solving, solving writing, we, we generally don't see it set out that way. It's there, it's an important part of legal logic, but if you look at a judgment, for example, which is the ultimate way in which a legal problem is described and answered, um, you, you rarely see, if ever, you know, issues, rules, application, conclusion. You see variations on it, but the point is that you can use it, please consider it, but you don't have to slavishly use those headings. And really what it comes down to is that when you're answering a legal problem, you're using some of the skills that hopefully you developed in introduction to law, things about legal reasoning. So deductive reasoning is one of them. Um, where you state a proposition, you then make a statement of fact, and you draw a logical legal conclusion from that. I'll give you an example. So, all dogs are mammals. This animal is a dog. Therefore, this animal is a mammal. Okay? So, it's legal logic. It's really logic, um, but dressed up in a legal form. Inductive reasoning is where you argue something which is a prediction based on experience. Reasoning by analogy is where you suggest that because something applies in one thing, then reasoning by analogy suggests that that thing will have characteristics in another thing. And you need to be careful with that because it can easily become faulty reasoning, reverse accident or hasty generalization. But reasoning by analogy is very commonly used by advocates in court cases to argue a point. There may not be anything directly on point, but by analogy, we refer to a case and we say that the general principles in that case should be applied in this situation. But there are some issues around faulty reasoning, so sweeping generalizations, hasty generalizations, irrational correlation and causation. You know, an example of that last one is this. 
During the last hundred years, we've seen less pirates. We've seen more global war warming. Therefore, global warming is causing a reduction in the number of pirates. You probably saw that in the textbook in Introduction to Law. So that's irrational correlation and causation. So just be careful about the way you use some of these legal reasoning skill skills. Um, but you do, do need to show that you're a critical thinker. And part of being a critical thinker is to, to be critical, um, which is, it's not simply criticism, it's informed criticism. So you have to ask whether your argument is reasonable if you're being critical of an argument for an opponent. Now this may be relevant to assessment two, where you're on your feet and you're presenting an argument. So ask yourself things like, does my argument contain validity? Is it consistent with primary sources of law primarily? Is it consistent with ethical standards as well? Always consider the ethical issues around answering any legal question. Even if you don't provide any contribution to the answer, at least keep that in mind. And remember, of course, that there are some critical skills that we want you to learn in studying law. You need to be able to interpret, analyze, evaluate, infer, explain. And the reason I'm mentioning those is that sometimes the way in which you answer a legal problem will be dependent upon the very first word in that problem. So if, for example, in, a, um, in the final exam, you'll have two essay style questions and examiners, including myself, will commence an essay style question with typically one of maybe five words. It might be interpret, or it might be analyze, or it might be evaluate or infer or explain. They're, they're kind of key opening words. Now, the fact is, they're not all the same. They're not synonyms. They, they each have a different nuance, a different requirement. So unless you know what, what an examiner actually means for you to say in response to a question that starts with interpret, it doesn't mean analyze. Interpret means something different to analyze. It means something different to explain. So you need to have these key ideas in mind. Let's go through it. Interpretation, interpret means determining the material facts. Analyze, the key issue on analyzing is the ability to identify hidden fe features. Evaluate is the ability to assess. Infer means that I'm really looking for you to draw logical conclusions based on something and explain is an ability to communicate results. So mostly it's explain, but they're all slightly different. Now that doesn't mean that you don't touch on different areas. If you're asked to explain something, you might need to interpret or analyze or infer, but just keep in mind that basic first word in a, an essay style question. All right, now that I've confused you with that, let's move on to the key areas of duress, undue influence, and unconscionable conduct. Chapters 15 to 17 of both your text and your case book. Now, just to get you started, can anyone tell me, now, last week, the key case was Walton's stores and Ma. What's the key case likely to be for this week's material? Any thoughts? What's the star case? Commonwealth and uh, Amadio. Sorry, Bothwell, what was that? Oh, is it Commonwealth and uh, Amadio? Amadio, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, uh, if I have trouble hearing you, it's probably because I've got some classical music playing in the background. My apologies. Um, which is, I don't think you can hear, but I can. <laughs> so if that makes sense. But Amadio is the key case. Now, there are different areas that we need to consider today or tonight. Duress is a common law doctrine and undue influence and unconscionable conduct or unconscionable dealing, another way of describing it, are equitable doctrines. And of course, this is filtered through into the statutory regime as well. But duress sits a little differently because it's common law based. The others are equitable doctrines. And in reality, 
there are really very few cases of duress in modern law. You won't find many cases that are based on that common law principle. Because from a practical perspective, duress as an argument in a legal case has been com almost completely subsumed by equitable undue influence um, and, and unconscionable conduct sits over the top of that as well. So we want you to know duress, but don't necessarily think of it as being the lead argument, as it were. So duress refers to a circumstance where one party forces or bullies another into doing something involving a contract. And duress relates to coercion, doesn't it? It's overbearing behaviour. And you might think when anyone enters into a contract, to some degree, there's pressure, isn't there? If you, like, let's say, if you want to buy a brand new car, have you felt some degree of pressure? The question is, if you've felt under that degree of pressure, if you sign up for your new car, can you then claim duress on the basis that I felt pressure to sign? The answer is probably no, because there may have been pressure, but it's pressure for both sides. There's pressure for the car dealer as well. And the question is, is duress such that it is an illegitimate pressure? And that's what the law is really all about. So I mentioned that there are a few cases based on duress. One example that you might consider is Crescendo Management, Proprietary Limited, against Westpac Banking Corporation. It was 1988-19 New South Wales law reports at 40. Now duress might be physical or it might be a threat, but it's all based on common law. Equity kind of extended this to include non-physical du duress. Now undue influence goes a little further because it means that there's the someone's taking advantage of, of a willing party, but the judgment is impaired. Duress involves the illegitimate pressure to force an unwilling compliance under threat of a person who's not necessarily vulnerable or in a relationship of dependency. So there's a key threshold question here where you need to look at, for want of a better term, the status of the party that is the innocent party and ask yourself, is this a party that is vulnerable? In which case, if it is, you're probably gonna be looking more at undue influence than duress. Uh, let's have an example of a, a duress question. So Mary had a contract with a tiler to retile her front deck for $5,000. Two days into the job, the tiler says, this is taking a lot longer than I expected. I'm gonna need an extra $3,000, it's a big tiling job. Um, and says, unless I get the $3,000 extra, I can't be responsible for what will happen to the house. Now this is while he's working on it. Mary pays the money and then tries to rescind the contract based on duress. Now is that duress and what are the issues? Well, firstly, you might ask yourself whether Mary has some sort of special or particular vulnerability in which case you may not be talking common law duress, you might be talking something else. But assume she doesn't have any particular vulnerability. I guess you've got to consider how the threat is char characterised. Was it unlawful? Was it an implied threat to cause willful damage? Do this or I'll damage your property? Or was it a case of if you don't pay the money, I can't guarantee the proper workmanship? So it gets a bit messy. Any questions based on that little simple example? All good? Mary found it a self position where she, now what was that Stephen? Yeah, obviously, so that um, being, being a tradesman myself, I can see where that guy's probably coming from. He's probably putting her, her into a position where, where she's under the influence of if, if I don't pay this guy, I'm not going to get my job finished. So he's he's putting undue pressure on her, um, pretty much to try and impel her to, to, to pay the money. 
Uh, we're really in, in the fact he's he's quoted that job. If if, if he can't quote properly, he's gonna he's gonna wear that. Yeah, in reality, he's probably got to wear it. Yeah, I understand. Thank you for that contribution. All right. So, um, so that's duress. Now, undue influence involves a person properly, um, improperly rather, taking advantage of someone with a, a, a vulnerability. Now, what do we call that vulnerability? It's a special relationship, isn't it? And that's where someone trying to take unfair, improper advantage over someone where there is a special relationship. Now, the most important of these really is the third, which is unconscionable conduct or dealing. And unconscionable conduct or dealing refers to circumstances where a stronger party takes advantage of another's special disability or special disadvantage. And this might have previously been thought of as duress or undue influence, but now it tends to be unconscionable conduct, both in terms of the common law, the case law, and statutory law. The leading case, Amadio, which is Commercial Bank of Australia against Amadio, as Bothwell pointed out, um, it's 1983 151 CLR 447. So um, in that case, the High Court dealt with a consideration of the law as it was and the law that was created as a result of that case. And the equitable principles relating to unconscionable dealing and the principles relating to undue influence, they are very close, but they are distinct according to the High Court. So undue influence, like common law duress, looks to the quality of the consent or assent of the weaker party. Whereas unconscionable dealing looks to the conduct of the stronger party in attempting to enforce or retain benefits of dealings with a person with a special disadvantage or disability in a way that is not consistent with equity or good conscience. So you need to consider how you answer these sorts of questions from the perspective of, am I looking at the conduct of the, if you're, for want of a better term, the guilty party, or am I looking at this from the circumstance of the innocent party? And try to be clear in terms of your argument, because it is easy in providing a response to some of these questions for it to be a bit of a jumble. So you need to create some flow charts, some good clear definitions, and have a good idea of when you make these arguments and determine what is your primary argument. It might be your only argument and then consider whether you have secondary arguments as well. So unconscionable conduct or dealing is generally if people are under a, a legal disability and they attempt to make a contract, the contract can be declared invalid. You know, um, you know minors, people who are mentally ill, intoxicated, in certain circumstances may be vulnerable um, in that perspective. And unconscionable, is a word that comes up a lot and it requires this element of exploitation. So um, I guess there are a few questions that you need to ask yourself as part of a flow chart. One is whether one party has a special disability and whether the nature of that special disability has resulted in an inequality of bargaining power between the two. And that's a key issue. And that's really what was dealt with in, in the Amadio decision. Now, when we talk about a special disability, we're really talking about the way in which that disability affects the person's capacity to make rational decisions in their own interests. Now, when we talk about capacity, there, um, we also then start to talk about issues of, um, you know, which are, which are involved in QCAT hearings. So, if um, someone lacks capacity to make legal decisions, then one option is for an application to be made to the tribunal, QCAT, for the appointment of a guardian or an administrator or both as a substitute decision maker for that person who lacks capacity. So when we talk about someone lacking capacity, then at a more extreme level, we're really talking about someone being appointed to make decisions for that person.
and that's a, it's, it's a QCAP and it's based on the Guardianship and Administration Act. So really this discussion is for something less than that, if I can use that general term. So when we think about special disability, we're not only talking about people who have no ability essentially to make any complex decisions, but something of that gray area where for certain reasons, people do have a special disability. Now a good case to look at is Blomley and Ryan in that regard. And it dealt with the contract for the sale and purchase of a grazing property. And um, what had happened is that the vendor was aged, been affected by a long bout of rum drinking and claimed to set aside a contract. Um, and the courts in that case looked at these categories of special disadvantage. So have a look at the decision of Fulliger, Justice Fulliger at 450. And um, his honor said, the circumstances adversely affecting a party which may induce a court of equity either, either to refuse its aid to, or to set aside a transaction are of great variety can hardly be satisfactorily classified, but among them are poverty or need of any kind, sickness, age, sex, infirmity of body or mind, drunkenness, illiteracy, lack of education, lack of assistance, or explanation where assistance or explanation is necessary. Now that last bit is important because that then leads us directly to Amadio. So in CBA and Amadio, the High Court dealt with this situation. So Mr. and Mrs. Amadio's son, Vincenzo, persuaded them to sign over their house as security for a business loan to assist him. Now Vincenzo needed the loan and the, consequently the security that was offered by mum and dad pretty badly. He, he actually misrepresented that the security would be for $50,000 for six months. But his parents' liability was not limited like that. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Amadio did not attend the bank's office in order to complete the contract documentation. Instead, the bank manager visited their home, and this was, this was Mr. Virgo. And Mr. and Mrs. Amadio had little spoken English. They had even less written English, and they clearly required an explanation of the documentation that they were requested to sign and the transaction as a whole. But Mr. Virgo, the bank manager, failed to do that. He heard Vincenzo say something about a, a limit of six months. And he did say that there was no such limit, but there was that's that was the almost the extent of it. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Amadio did not know whether Vincenzo was able to meet his loan repayments. Um, and they were not, they did not know that if he was unable to do so, that the house could be at stake, which is a key issue. That's why they were there. And the evidence was accepted by the court that they didn't realize that. So crucially, the bank by Mr. Virgo did not take any steps to ensure that the Mario's were genuinely consenting with a proper understanding of the transaction. And predictably, of course, Vincenzo's company did default. It borrowed an additional $91,000 on the overdraft. Just a few days later, it went into liquidation. The bank sought security and the matter went to court in the high court. So it was really groundbreaking stuff at the time. Now, here are some of the things that were important and which distinguish it from like the Blomley and Ryan situation. The Amadios, they weren't under any physical disability. They weren't under any mental disability. That wasn't a QCAT type, you know, someone uh, lacks capacity and someone needs to make decisions for them. There was no intoxication like Blomley and Ryan, um, but they were still faced with a special inability to properly attend to their own interests. And that was what the High Court considered appropriate in that case. Now, of course, now we have the Australian Consumer Law and the High Court of confirmed that the principles in relation to unconscionable conduct apply similarly for claims for relief by way of equitable compensation under the Australian consumer law. So when you're arguing these things, 
even though you might think duress, I tend to park that to a side unless it's a very clear instance of duress, even undue influence, and look at primarily issues around unconscionable conduct and um, possibly the ACL. So the, the modern elements, if you like, of dealing with these issues were set out in Amadio. And I'd have a good look at that because in Amadio, it identifies, if you like, when the jurisdiction is enlivened to deal with those issues. Where a party is under a special disability, where there is a, a specific consequence um, as a result of that special uh, disability that the, the disability was sufficiently evident to the stronger party to make it prima facie unconscious, unconscientious is the term we use, to proceed and uh, deal with those circumstances in that way that they did. Basically, it's not fair um, and it shouldn't remain. So have a good idea of, of how that apply, applies and have some quotes ready to um, put forward to justify any arguments that you have in those areas. All right, are there any questions at the moment or are we all good? All good? Thank you. The problem with not asking, asking questions, of course, or making comments is that it only encourages me to keep going. So um, bear that in mind. Now, of course, it's all very well to have an argument to say, I'm not happy, but the question then from the court will be, well, what do you want us to do? And one of the clear options that might be available is to ask for a contract to be set aside. And this is really equitable. This is really nothing to do with the common law in the sense of common law versus equity. So equity does have a well-established jurisdiction to set aside unconscious, unconscientious bargains. And a transaction might be set aside for unconscionable conduct in a couple of circumstances. Now, this is really a Mario. One party is under a special disadvantage or disability in dealing with the other party, and the special disability or disadvantage was sufficiently evident to the other party to make it unfair or unconscionable for that other party to accept or retain the benefit of the transaction. That's really the key to Amadio. Now where this doctrine applies, the general remedy is to allow rescission at the election of the vulnerable party, or at very least the court will refuse to enforce a contract if it considers that the obligation was unconscionable. Um, now, an example of this, um, 1992 decision, and so this follows on from Amadio, is Louth and Diprose. L-O-U-T-H v. Diprose, 1992, 175 CLR 621. Now, Mr. Diprose, I think was a solicitor, um, and he fell head over heels for Ms. Louth. Now, Ms. Louth sought help from Mr. Diprose, and she said, if you don't give me that help, I'll commit suicide. Mr. Diprose agreed to purchase a home. He transferred the home into her name. Three years later, the two had a falling out. Ms. Diprose sought the house to be transferred. Uh, Mr. Diprose wanted the house back into his name. She refused, the matter went to court. And the High Court said that his infatuation and emotional dependence on her amounted to him, even though he's a solicitor, having a special disability for the purpose of unconscionable dealings. So it was an extension of this Amadio situation. And the court said that she'd manufactured an atmosphere of crisis with respect to the house when none really existed to influence him to provide the money for the purchase of the home. And her conduct was described as dishonest and smacked of fraud and jurisdiction of equity to set aside gifts um, procured by unconscionable conduct arises as a result of three factors. Number one, a, re a relationship between the parties where there is one party with a special disadvantage as opposed to the other. 
the second party's unconscientious uh, exploitation of, of that disadvantage and the consequent overbearing of will whereby the person had no worthwhile judgment as to what was in his or her best interests. So that's the three part test that was espoused in Lauth and Dipro. So do have a look at that. You know, one of the keys to all of this is that it relates to inequality of bargaining power. Um, but bear in mind that merely because you have a contract with someone with a special disability does not mean it follows that it is unconscionable. It's unconscionable if it results in a contract that would be improper for the courts to enforce. And I know that's very vague. You think, well, what's proper, what's improper? And it's a matter of fact, and it's a matter of arguing or arguing the toss. So a party that who is not under a disability must know that this is the case and take advantage of it as a prerequisite. So how do you, what's the logic then that you need to apply when you're considering answering one of these qu questions or um, problems? So if the unconscionable dealing appears to be a factor in a contract, ask yourself a few things. Now, firstly, party A, was, was they, were they inhibited by their circumstances from properly looking into their own interests? Did they have this special disability? And did party B either know that or was aware of it was a possibility or is aware of facts that would indicate a reasonable person to a reasonable person the possibility of a disability? And then finally, did party B take advantage of that circumstance. So you need to set out those basic steps, if you like, have authorities to support the propositions then argue from one perspective or the other. And you could probably tell you need a lot of this for the second assessment, won't you? Now, Sorry, there are some defences to this. Yes, Stephen? So just, I know, I know we're talking about disabilities, but even if the fact if, if you've got two two parties coming together for for a contract and on obviously one person has the full knowledge and say so, so you've come to me to provide a service i've got the full knowledge of, of the service you don't know anything about it i'm sort of in the position and you're taking every information that i'm giving you as gospel to make the decision upon yourself where i've been in the position where i've seen quotes for people that have given them to me and, and i've looked at them and, and sort of thinking You've only got to supply power to your house, mate, not, not the rest of your suburb. So it, it, can that be looked upon as a disability? The fact is, as one party's got no knowledge whatsoever and they're relying completely on the other party who's taken advantage of that to, to um, sort of uh, get gain out of it? That's a really good question because it goes to the heart of the problem as to whether there is this special disability. And it used to be relatively easy because, you know, if someone um, couldn't speak English, couldn't understand, were illiterate, um, um, there are issues where you could say, well, this this person has a special disability. But then we have Louth and Disro Dipros, where you've got um, a solicitor involved, and and it becomes even more broadly determined. And there's no straight answer to that, Stephen. Um, my personal view is that it's still in that situation, unlikely to be successful argument on behalf of the consumer, unless you can show that there was some reason why you felt compelled to sign up now, here and there, instead of seeking competitive quotes, undertaking some basic research, um, applying some common sense as well. So, but it's, it's interesting because you need to look at these problems from the perspective of both the guilty party in inverted commas and the innocent party because it's not always black and white then not always the black hat and the white hat so to speak um, in in these situations because on the other hand if you have something where a party says well you you've done this work for me but i'm not going to pay because i felt under pressure um then the contractor is entitled to say well gee you know I'm the one that's done all this work and I, I was working on a pretty low margin. Um, you've got to look at it from my perspective as well, which is a good segue into what is the main defense to this. 
So if you're acting for the respondent to an unconscionable conduct or dealing claim, what you're really looking to say is that this transaction was fair, it was just, and it was reasonable. And that's the defence, that the transaction was fair, just, and reasonable. Now, if another party knows of the disability, then if that party deals with them fairly, even though they've got a special disability, then there's no unconscionable conduct in those circumstances. So it comes down to this question of fairness and whether a court of equity would allow this transaction to proceed or not proceed. I mean, and it's the, the key question is, how does a party show that the transaction was fair, just and reasonable in all the circumstances? Now, in the Amadio case, can you think of any way in which, with the benefit of hindsight, the bank might have been able to successfully argue that the transaction as between it and Mr. and Mrs. Amadio was fair, just and reasonable. I know it's only a small group, so I'm not gonna pick on anyone, but if anyone has any thoughts, please let me know. What could the bank have done? Did they walk away? Or is there some way they could have saved this transaction? Take a translator, says Bridget. Yes, I like that. Anything else? Any other thoughts? If the bank manager took time to translate, yes. A bit more care. Any others? All right, they're good answers. The best way of doing it um, would be to have the party with a special disability obtain independent legal advice regarding the transaction. And I know, because I was in practice in 1983 when Amadio came out, and um, up until that time, bank transactions were undertaken in the way that was described in the Amadio case. He has signed the documents pro forma, but following that, things changed dramatically, and almost always, guarantors were asked to seek independent legal advice. So, here, Mr. and Mrs. Amadio, here's a document. Um, I'm not going to explain it to you as such, but I will set this out and you need to obtain independent legal advice. It's, a, it's one of the best ways of defending it. Then it's very difficult for the Amadios to say that they were um, dealt with unconscionably. All right, so any questions then on unconscionable dealing or conduct? As you can tell, that's where most of my emphasis has been. We understand the difference then between that and duress. So just going back to duress, it's where the offending party to an agreement uses illegitimate pressure to force someone else to go into an agreement or modify an agreement such that they obtain a benefit. You know, so feeling pressure in a car dealership that's not illegitimate pressure. It's pressure, but it's not illegitimate pressure. But saying something which is in the form of a threat, it becomes illegitimate pressure, doesn't it? And duress may be in three forms. It might be threat to the person, or indeed it might actually be um, you know, an injury to the person, or threats to property, or economic duress, which is a threat of economic harm. So for duress, there are two elements whether the victimised party consent was impaired by the threat and whether the nature of the threat was improper. So when you're dealing with the issue of consent, you need to consider whether there is any impairment of that consent. Um, you know, a basic principle is that there has to be a meeting of the minds, doesn't there? The parties need to be ad idem of one mind. And if there's an argument relating to impaired consent, it suggests that the party may not, the parties may not have been of one mind. So if you're arguing impairment of consent, there are three sub elements. The first is that there must have been a threat. The victim of the threat must consider the party making the threat can carry it out. And the threat must be one of the reasons for the victim's behavior. So um, a quote that deals with that is from a case of, and I'll spell it P-A-O, new word, O-N, 
be L-A-U, Y-I-U and L-O-N-G. So Pawan versus uh, against Lao Yao Long, 1980 AC 614. Lord Scarman said that there must be a coercion of will such that there is no true consent. It must be shown that the contract was not a voluntary act. Um, and it really comes down to this question of what is the extent where there is pressure that is legitimate versus pressure that is illegitimate. So I'm talking now duress. Is the threat or pressure lawful? Um, when does it become unlawful? It's really a matter of determining it on the facts and arguing. It's a complex issue. And this is part of why we don't see many duress cases now. Um, but courts will not regard a threat not to enter a contract as a form of duress. So if it's a, look, take it or leave it, here's my offer, courts don't regard that as duress. That's just part of normal negotiations. But what are the remedies for duress? Usually it's, it's, so it's common law based. So the standard remedy is to rescind the contract and the courts will order that the parties be returned as much as possible to the position they were in before the contract was formed. Um, so the key point with duress is it's common law. There must be threats. There must have been um, something went into being illegitimate pressure and um, uh, that it's, uh, th that's the basis upon which the party made the contract. So that's coming back to duress. Now the reason I'm coming back to duress is I just want you to be in a position where you can contrast that to what is the most important area, which is undue, um, which is uh, unconscionable conduct or unconscionable dealing. But remember, of course, the second area, which is undue influence, still very important and it's where a stronger party dominates the weaker party, causing them to enter into a contract against their own interests. And here, when we're dealing with undue influence, there's got to be an imbalance of power. And um, the key question is, is the second party unable to exercise an independent judgment in entering into the contract? So undue influence looks a bit like unconscionable conduct, but they are, as was earlier described, distinct. So you need to have some clear ideas of what the two mean when you'd argue with them, uh, when you'd argue these things, and um, when you would um, uh, promote these arguments. So um, the contract in that situation would be voidable, as, to, as opposed to being void ab initio. Um, the injured party may affirm it or terminate. Uh, the weaker party may rescind the contract. So one of the things you need to do when dealing with undue influence is to distinguish between what is simply influence and what is undue influence. It's a bit like the categorization we were making before about pressure. So a person who is in a position of influence as a result of you know, their personality or skills or knowledge is entitled and will often influence others. But at some point, but at some point, that influence may become improper and that's when the rules of undue influence um, come into play. So don't make the mistake of assuming that there, because there was influence, that that therefore means it was undue influence because there's, there's a, an imaginary line between the two. Unfortunately, it's a gray area, it depends on the facts. There are some examples. One case is Khan and Khan. It's 200462 NSWLR at 239. And um, in that case, the seller of property continued with the sale of property, not because he wanted to, but because um, she deferred to the authority of a spiritual advisor in relation to the issue. And in that case, there was undue influence argued successfully. But undue influence can be presumed or it can be actual. Um, there are some recognised relationships that you need to consider. The categories are not clear, they're not closed, um, but they might include parent and child, 
doctor and patient, solicitor and client, etc., but not husband and wives. So the key case to deal with the issues of presumed undue influence and the recognised relationships is Johnson and Buttress. Johnson and Buttress, 1936, 56 CLR 113. So in that case, Chief Justice Latham said, whenever the relationship between a vulnerable party and a stronger party is such that the latter is in a position to exercise dominion over the former by reason of trust and confidence reposed in the latter, the presumption of undue influence is raised. Another case that you might want to consider is Hartigan against the International Society for Krishna Consciousness Incorporated, Hare Krishnas. 2002, New South Wales Supreme Court, 810. So the plaintiff was a member of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, gave her house and farm to the society, and the plaintiff misunderstood the religious treating, uh, teachings of the movement wrongly thought that it required her to give up all of those possessions. Um, as a result of doing so, she was left with three small children, no housing options, and the New South Wales Supreme Court determined that the transaction did give rise to a presumption of undue influence by the defendant. That presumption was not rebutted. Um, no one in the Krishna consciousness movement sought to overbear or deceive or deprive her of her opportunity of making up her own mind, but it was still action taken in the con context of a relationship where undue influence could be presumed. So it's a difficult one to argue either way, but it's there to be considered. Now there are recognised relationships in undue influence, there's non-recognised relationships, but it's essentially a matter of determining from the evidence whether between two parties, the weaker party placed confidence and trust in the stronger party and relied upon them for guidance. And because it's non-recognised, it could be any situation that might occur. Uh, but once a relationship of influence is demonstrated by the evidence, then it is treated as though there was, it is one of the recognised categories of relationships listed uh, earlier. Um, and the stronger party wants to enforce those contractual obligations, they'll need to rebut that presumption in the same way. So there's a list of the recognised categories. It can be non-recognised. If you get over that threshold question, then the courts will treat it as though it was a recognised relationship. Now, um, again, what's the remedy for undue influence? Um, it's the same for contracts under duress, rescission, and restoration of the parties to their previous position before they entered into. But it will be unavailable um, if it's not possible to restore the parties to their former position. So that's a key point about whether you're going to argue undue influence. So the usual remedy is to rescind, but the right is subject to the same limitations as in equity. And that is, if there's delay or you can't return the parties to their original positions or third parties are unduly impacted, then the courts may not grant that remedy. Now, I know I've done a lot of talking tonight. Thank you very much for your patience in listening through it. But what are the key aspects of this? The key aspects are that we've talked about unconscionable conduct, we've talked about duress, and we've talked about undue influence. And if you're presented with a problem to answer in relation to certain facts around this area, I'm not going to say this is a problem that relates to duress at common law, or this is a problem that relates to unconscionable conduct. You've got to look at the facts and then determine for yourself what are the key arguments and what is the primary argument that you wish to put forward. You can argue in the alternative, you know, but usually there's one very strong key argument that you'd advance. Uh, and there's not necessarily going to be a right or wrong answer because you might with equal force argue, for example, unconscionable conduct and duress with a given set of circumstances, 
um, but it's unlikely. There's usually going to be a clear, strong or dominant argument that I'd like to see. All right, so that's it for the week four material. Next week is um, vacation week. So there'll be no live session. If you really feel in the mood to do so, please join at six o'clock on Thursday and um, have a discussion with, with classmates. I may pop in, but I, I, I may not do. Um, and, uh, but we'll certainly see you in two weeks from now. And at that stage, we'll deal with week five material, which is illegality. All right, so enjoy your break for one week and we'll see you in two weeks. Before I leave, any questions, comments? All good? All right, thank you very much. I'll end the session now. All the best, bye.